Romans chapter 8. We've been talking about setting your houses, house in order, and the Lord's been taking a step-by-step step through this. Set your house in order, step-by-step, step, because He loves us. He knows that there are some things coming in the future that we need to be prepared for. And so He's walking us through not only the Word of God, but things that the Holy Spirit is saying. How many of you know we not only need what God said, but we need to know what God is saying? And for God to tell us what he's saying, he will direct us to different passages of scripture and say, that one right now, this one I'm, I'm dealing with you today on. Put this into practice today. See, you wouldn't know which one to implement today unless the Holy Spirit prompted you to it. That doesn't mean we don't obey the word of God in its entirety, but there are certain principles that need to be applied today as opposed to last week. And so the Holy Spirit is speaking some things today and taking us uh, to us and walking us step by step to get our houses in order because in the not too distant future, there's some things coming on our society that we're not going to be caught off guard with. Can you say amen to that? Is our God good? He's good. How many of you would like a one hour warning for large earthquakes? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't that be helpful? And this is what the Lord is doing. The Lord is saying there's some things coming, but unlike the rest of the people in the world, you are going to be tipped off. You're going to know it in advance. And so we're going to be ready. Well, the Lord's specifically been talking to us about setting our priorities in order. And today, I want to talk to you about eternal awareness. Eternal awareness. And we'll start here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And let's all read the 18th verse out loud together. I'm reading from the New King James Version. If you don't have that translation, then follow along on the screen so we can all read the same words, would you? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and everybody reading nice and loudly, verse 18, let's read. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Let's all read it again out loud, everybody. Ready? One, two, three, go. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, isn't that a kind of a strange scripture? Listen, don't look at what you can see. Only look at what you can't see. It's kind of weird, isn't it? See, we give the Bible a lot of grace because we know God knows what he's talking about. But if anybody came up and told us that, hey, listen, don't look at what you can see. Only look at what you can't see. We'd say, you're a freak. <laughs> That's weird. What are you talking about? But how many of you know God knows what he's talking about? And God is saying, listen, there is an unseen realm that is the realm that controls the seen realm. And he's saying, you need to stop looking so much at the seen realm, the visible realm, and look at this invisible realm that is controlling and manipulating the visible realm. Look at it again. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. Everybody say temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Are eternal. You know what God's saying? God's saying, pay attention to the things that really matter. Pay attention to the things that really matter. How many of you know some things are more important than other things? Not all things are equal in value. Some things are more important than other things. Let me give you an example that's kind of embarrassing to tell you the truth. I was driving in the car with my wife, Kimberly. And I think I had my phone out and I was looking up some directions. You know how these smartphones, you know, you can look up the directions and maps and everything else. And so I was looking up the directions. She looked over and said, you need to pay attention to your driving. I said, I am, but I'm looking up the directions. And she said, Whoa. and so she reached over and grabbed the wheel. And she said, well, here, I'll drive and you, and you look up what you're looking up. I said, okay, great. So, uh, so she had the wheel, and so I took my hand off the wheel, and I, I look, I'm, you know, did, fooling with this thing, and, you know, and I, I'm looking at it, and then I glanced up at her, and she had her hand on the wheel, but she was doing a text message with her phone on the other. <laughs> and I said, hey, what are you doing? She said, oh, I forgot, I forgot. You guys need to pray for your pastors, man, I'm telling you. How many of you know that's bad? That's bad. 
I didn't even have my hand on the wheel. I'm pushing the pedal. And she's got her hand on the wheel. She's not even looking. She's doing a text message. She said, I forgot. How many of you know we need to pay attention? And we need to pay attention to the right things. Because what we were looking down at was not as important as what we could have been looking up at. And this is what the Lord's saying. The Lord's saying, you're focused on so many things here in this world, but I want you to know that there's another world that is more consequential. If you don't focus on the spirit world, if you don't focus on eternal things, then you're headed for a major collision of eternity. A collision of eternal consequence. And this is what the Lord's saying. I need you to pay attention to reality. Reality is not just what you see with your eyes. Reality is what's going on in the unseen realm that's going to last forever. And it will impact you. Somebody said, well, that doesn't impact me. Oh, yes, it does. And it will. Yes, it does. And it will. Now, Romans chapter 8. Let's look at the fifth verse there. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. And Paul, of course, is talking here as well. And he says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Notice again, Paul says, Those people that live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, natural things. But those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And so the Lord is telling us, if you're really going to be spiritual people, you're going to have to set your mind, change your mind, adjust your perspective, adjust your focus, and begin to look at eternal things. Begin to look at the unseen realm. Why? Because that's where the reality is. You can be fooled in this world. How many of you have ever seen a magician and they do something and you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, the, the simple tricks you can figure out. But some of them, you go, wait a minute, how, how, how did he do that? How did he do that? Because they trick your eyes. They trick your eyes. But the Lord's saying, listen, this world has a way of tricking your eyes and making you think that you know what's going on. But you don't. And we need to readjust our perspective to see what God sees. Some of you would remember a few years ago at the mall, they had these kiosks and they would have these pictures and all they were were like colored dots. You remember this? And you'd walk up and you know, you'd see people standing there looking at it. And you'd, you'd walk up, what are they looking at? And you're looking at the colored dots and you're wondering, what are they looking at? And uh, you'd say, well, what are you looking at? And they say, well, there's a three dimensional image in there. So you look at it. Yeah, I don't see it. I don't see any three-dimensional. And you begin to wonder right away, are they messing with me? Where, where are the cameras, right? Where the, it's one of those hidden camera things. Where are the cameras? But they said, no, 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 I really see it. I really see it. And they say, I, I see an eagle on the world. <laughs> and so you're looking at it and they said, no, no, you have to like readjust your focus and say, okay. trying to see that thing and uh you see it no i don't see it and so finally then you ask him hold on a second well, right before you came to the mall what did you smoke because maybe i can't see it because i didn't smoke what you smoked say no 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 we really see it and they say you have to and so i i gazed in there and eventually it's like oh and your eyes refocus and all of a sudden i see it i see it then you go to the next one and once you get the hang of it you can see it in all of them and then somebody else walks up and says what are you looking at Check this out. This is really cool. There's this three-dimensional image. Look, there's an eagle on a world right there. I don't see it. You've got to refocus your eyes. And they're doing all that, and they're saying, you guys are lying. You guys are lying. You know what? There's a whole world out there that thinks we're lying. They think we're faking this. They think we don't see this. But how many of you know we do see it? And how many of you know this unseen realm is real? You know, in, in actuality, most of the world knows there's a spirit world. They know that there is phenomena that is unexplainable in any other way than there's got to be something in the unseen realm. They know it. Most everybody in the world has walked through a dark hallway or a dark alley and fear grips them. And I mean, it's not just an emotion. 
they can feel something tangible going on. And so most people would admit that there's a spirit realm. They just don't know how to define it or interpret it. And so they're subject to all of the demonic and deceiving spirits that are out there with the psychics and everybody trying to make money off of them. They're subject to all that. They don't know the truth. But God's word clearly describes exactly how the spirit realm works. Who's in charge and how we can, with the name of Jesus and the word of God, dominate the spiritual atmosphere so that it manifests in the natural realm. And this is what God is saying. God is saying, listen, I need you to be more aware of what's happening in the spirit realm than you are of what's happening in the the natural realm. I need you to be aware of eternal things. Now listen, Paul the apostle and and the other apostles, they went about... And they lived in such a way that they, they believed that eternal things were more important than natural things. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians fifteen nineteen, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. Look at it again. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. In other words, if, it, if this life is all there is then you need to feel sorry for us because we blew it. Because we're living as if there's something better coming. We're living as as if there's something more important coming. We're making decisions and denying ourselves of certain privileges and things that are not necessarily even sin. But we're putting our stock and our stake in eternal things. I know that sometimes Kimberly... We'll say, uh, I'll say, hey, you want to get some lunch? She said, yeah, I'll come down and meet you at the church and we'll go get some lunch. I'll say, great. And you know, between now and then, sometimes people say, hey, you hungry? Yeah, I am hungry. You want to go get some lunch? Well, no, I would, but uh, Kimberly's coming to meet me for lunch. And it doesn't matter what they offer me. Hey, you want to go get some spaghetti? You want to go get some steak? You want some tamales? Whatever. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter. It doesn't tempt me. Why? Because you, my friend, are not my wife. And my wife is coming and eating lunch with her is superior. It's the best. Doesn't mean I don't like you. But I like her more. And I've already told her I'm waiting for her. Let me tell you, Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back with blessings and rewards for those people that are living their lives for him. But there are some people that are acting like he's not coming back. There are a whole lot of believers that live their life as if this is all there is. And they're trying to get everything right now. And when he comes back, they're going to be surprised because they weren't ready for it. They weren't thinking it was real. Let me tell you, this is real. This is real. How many of you know that we all have loved ones, particularly those of us that have been serving God for a a period of time and have had family members, we have loved ones that are already in heaven. How many of you know that's real? I said that's real. Sometimes we get so caught up in this life that we think this life is where it's at. Oh no, we're going to be in heaven for eternity. How long is that? How many years is that? You can't even measure it in years. We don't even have enough years to measure that. A billion? A trillion? A zillion? Is that what comes next? At least in our vocabulary, there's a a zillion years when you're a kid. We don't even have enough numbers to measure what eternity is. So see, it's like James says. James says, this life is like a vapor of smoke. It's nothing compared to eternity. And yet we put so much stock and stake in this life. Like this is the big deal. This is nothing. This is here and gone. Let me tell you. If you could measure eternity. Then about a billion years from now. You'd look back and you say. Remember? Remember when we were on the earth? I mean for those couple of days. I mean just like that. You remember that? It's going to be so nothing. In comparison to eternity. So why would we make such a big deal about this life and not focus on what's going to happen for eternity. See, that's the big thing. And how many of you know, if you know Jesus Christ, then your eternity is sealed. I mean, you've already won the war. Isn't that right? And so you may have some little, we can't even really call them battles. There are little skirmishes here. 
you know, little, little conflicts here. But the war has been won for you. But the problem is, it hasn't been won for everybody. There are a whole lot of unbelievers and there are a whole lot of people in the church that are living their lives as if there's no eternity. Because that's the way the world trains us. But here God is telling us right now, listen, if you're going to set your house in order, you're going to have to refocus your thinking. And I want you to begin to be aware that this life is just something very temporary. It's something very low in value in comparison to eternity. Things you do in this life that affect eternity are high value. High value. Things that you do in life that are just temporary. Money, stuff. That's just, that's just temporary. But it has no eternal significance. But you can use it for eternal significance if you have your mind focused on it. I remember when I was working for Stater Brothers Market that when I was a checker, I not only was checking. In fact, I didn't check as much as other checkers because I was what they call a closer. I would close the store at night. And so along with a manager, usually an assistant manager, I would be the primary person that would close the store. And so they would have another checker that would check people. And then when they got really busy, they'd call me up. But normally I'm in the back. I'm stocking milk. I'm stocking soda pop. And there are certain products that have to be stocked before you close the store so that when they open the next morning, they're all, they're all fully stocked. Well, sometimes the store would get busy and there'd be other clerks and for like on a Friday night. Sometimes there'd be a couple of us that were stocking and closing. And sometimes they'd get busy and so they wouldn't really stock everything. They would just what's called face it up. They would bring all the product to the front to make it look full. And they'd say, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it tonight. Don't worry about it. Just face it up. Just face it up. And I never did listen to them. Let me tell you why. Because when I first got hired as box boy, I worked weekday mornings with the manager of the store and I watched him go through his routine every morning and he'd walk through and he'd lean down look in the milk and make sure it was all full all the way to the back he'd go over to the soda pop and he'd look looking all over it and he'd check it all out and when they didn't do it right the night before I'd hear him cuss and everything else and he was mad he was mad. So see, once I got promoted and then made it to the place where I was one of the closers and other people would say, don't worry about that. Just face it up. We're busy tonight. Don't worry about that. I never did listen to him. You know why? Because I knew the manager. I knew the manager's heart. And I knew the next morning the manager who hired me and signs that paycheck, he's the one that I'm pleasing. I'm not pleasing this coworker right here. If you, you want to be a knucklehead, go ahead and be a knucklehead. But no, 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 no. The manager hired me. I know who he is and I know what he likes. I'm, I'm working as unto him. Listen, you have to know who the manager is. How many of you know God is the head of this world? And the Bible says that nobody that's entangled in warfare or engaged in warfare entangles himself with just the affairs of this life because you need to... Please him who enlisted you as a soldier. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, what you said is, from this point on, I'm living in a way that pleases you. And even other believers will cause you and want you to compromise pleasing the Lord. But you need to say, no, no, thank you, though. You go on. You go on and compromise. No, I'm not going to do it. Why? Because, see, when Jesus enlisted me into this family and into this army, I committed myself to please him. And when he does the walk around and looks in there, I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Isn't that right? Well done, good and faithful servant. When I left the company to enter full-time ministry, uh, my manager said to me, he, and he didn't, he didn't dish out a lot of compliments, but he said, you were the best I had. You were the best I had. That was my well done, good and faithful servant. Listen, we need to live our lives in a way that please God, not please this world, not please ourselves, not make ourselves look successful to everybody. We need to live our lives in a way that pleases the Lord. Looking at eternal things. And when we look at eternal things, we have a different perspective. And sometimes we say, no, no. And somebody says, why? Look at that. Yeah, I, I know to you it seems like, well, of course you have to do this. But I got my sights on some other things. I've got my sights on some other things. They're more important to me. And in the process of time, if you make it where I'm going, you'll see what I mean. If you make it. Amen. Everybody's going to live 
for eternity, but where? Everybody's going to live for eternity, but where? In Hebrews 9.27, the writer says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, and he goes on to talk about things, I, I want to just point out what he said in this little tiny verse. As it is appointed for men to die, what? Once, but after this. But after this. Something comes after this life. You die once, but after this. What comes after you die? Everybody say, the judgment. The judgment. I remember when I was in school, particularly college, and sometimes the professor, a certain professor would bust out and say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to have a final exam. How many of you know you could not only feel the relief, but you could hear it. People go, shoo, shoo. And instantly their behavior would change because it was announced there would be no final exam. How many of you believe that people, the night before, what would have been the final exam, people are going to be up drinking coffee and cramming on, on for the test? They're going to do that? No. They're not going to do that. Why? There's no final. There's no final. Most people are not there really to get the education. They're there to get the degree and the grade. And so they're not studying to know the material. How many of you want your doctor to have studied to know the material? Isn't that right? I don't care what grade they got. Do you know what you're talking about? We need you to understand these things. But the teacher will announce, hey, there's no final, and everybody's behavior changed. There are many Christians today that are living as if there's no final exam. Thinking somebody announced to them there's no judgment. But I want you to know, yes, there is. Look what it says right there. It's appointed unto men to die once. But after that is the judgment. After that is the judgment. It's not a test, it's judgment. In other words, you're not going to come to answer the question. No, no, you answered the questions in your life. Now it's the judgment. It's the grading of the test. You're in the test now. You're in the test now. The judgment is the grading of the test. Living in this life is the test. The decisions we make, the things we say, the things we do, are the answers to the, to the quiz. Those are the final answers. And then, then comes the grading of it, the judgment, after we die. Now, there are a couple of judgments talked about in the Word of God that I think that are important for us to mention. One is the judgment seat of Christ, and it's mentioned several places. But let me read from Romans 14, the 10th through the 12th verses. Listen to this. Paul said, But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now this is talking to believers. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 11. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Each of us shall give account of himself to God. How many of you know, if you could live with the reality that there was a judgment coming and you were going to give account of yourself to God, how many of you know that would change your behavior? How many of you know that? I remember when I was a kid and my mom would spank me, you know, when I do wrong, but then you grow up a little bit and uh, she spanks you and you start to cry and you realize, you know what, that didn't hurt that bad. <laughs> and then she, you know, she'd give you a lot and you just, <laughs> It doesn't hurt, Mom. And she... Mm. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. And so you thought you had her, right? Can't mess with me no more, man. And then she'd say, Well, you wait till your father gets home. <laughs> ah, that hurt already. That hurt already. Because Dad was from the old school. The old school, you didn't spank, you beat kids. I, I'm not saying that's right, and, and I'm, I'm against abusing kids. I, I just want everybody to know that. Uh, but my dad wasn't. <laughs> and uh, I'm telling you, when she said, wait till your father gets home, she just ruined my afternoon. I mean, that's all you could think about. You want something to eat? No, I'm not hungry. 
You can't, you can't even function. And then we start to laugh, and then you remember, oh, because you know you're going to get it. You know you're going to get it. How many of you know the fear of the Lord, the Bible says, causes one to depart from evil? Sometimes we keep compromising in our lives because we don't have the fear of God in our hearts. And the fear of the Lord needs to be taught. You need to learn that. It does, it, it's not natural. You need to be taught the fear of the Lord. This is why we read our Bibles every day. When, if you'll just read the Bible, I'm telling you, if you will just read it, it'll freak you out. Somebody said, why would I read it? Because if you're not freaked out here, you're going to be freaked out for eternity. Let me tell you, God is real. He's a just God, a holy God. And judgment does come. Judgment does come. And the fear of the Lord, the Bible also says, is the beginning of wisdom. You're not walking in wisdom until you fear God. You got worldly wisdom that makes you look good in front of everybody else. But let me tell you, in light of eternity, you're doing foolish things. That's foolish. The fear of the Lord is where wisdom begins. When you fear God and begin to make decisions like that, that that's when wisdom started for you. The fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge, Proverbs says. And so, we need to have these things in mind. You can't set your house in order properly without an awareness that this natural world is not what it's about. It's about the eternal world. It's about what's coming. We keep looking to posture ourselves and get, let's get comfortable. We need to get comfortable. We need to be happy. Okay, you can be happy and compromise eternal things. And one day you're going to realize it and say, what was I thinking? I got so caught up in this world. Well, there's another judgment the Bible talks about called the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment. And it's found in Revelation 20. And I want to read the 10th through the 15th verses. Listen to this. Revelation 20 verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Somebody say amen. amen. He needs to be. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Everybody say lake of fire. Does that make you want to go swimming? Man, that does not sound fun, does it? was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and, listen to this, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Tormented. There's no break. There's no parole. There's no getting out on good behavior. Don't you listen to all the lies? Some people try to make this and say, well, hell's not a literal place. It's just a, a, a figment. It's just a, a concept that God brought in to make it a deterrent. Well, listen, God cannot lie. He's not faking. This is a real place. And it says they'll be tormented day and night. Day and night. What we would call 24 hours a day. Listen. Forever? How long is forever? Well, it never stops, does it? Forever. Then why did it say, and ever? You can't add to forever. There's only one reason it says that. To emphasize it to us so we didn't miss it the first time. God's saying, do you realize that this thing is a torment? A place designed to torment you day and night forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and then it goes on to say in verse 11 then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great standing notice this the dead are standing why because their bodies died we put their bodies in the ground so to speak but their spirits. The inside is not dead. You were made as an eternal being. And so John said, I saw them, the dead. They were all standing before God and books were open. And another book was open, which is called the book of life. And the dead 
were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. In other words, everybody that died in the ocean drowned. All of them come back up. The uh, death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Everybody. Verse 14. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In other words, you remember we read before, it's appointed to men to die once. Well, this, this, this lake of fire is the second death. See, after the judgment, if you're not judged correctly, if you didn't pass the test, then you get a second death. But it's not a death where you stop living or breathing or acknowledging or being aware or conscious. It's a death of separation. Death always means separation. When, you're, when you died, when that first death happened, your body was separated from your spirit and soul. Death means disconnection or separation. And this second death is a permanent separation and disconnection from God, life, love, freedom, happiness, all of that. Permanent, eternal disconnection. That's the second death. You don't want to be a part of that. You don't want to be a part of that. So look what it says. Verse 15. And anyone, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into what? Boy, that's that one that the devil will be cast into. Torment, day and night, forever and ever. Anyone, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me tell you, that's not what you want. That's not what you want. If you live your life and you are unaware of reality going on in the unseen realm, you're unaware that there's a real God who sent a real Savior and you gave your life to Him. He forgave you. You don't have to earn salvation. But if you said the little prayer and accepted Jesus and his forgiveness and everything, and then you walked away and ignored everything he's telling you to do, then that showed that you really didn't give him your life. You said you did, but you didn't. I could walk up to you and say, look, look, I give you a thousand dollars and walk away. And you're like, well, where is it? You heard what I said. (laughs) I heard what you said, but you never gave it to me. How many of you know, there's, talk can be cheap. And sometimes people give their lives to Jesus, but they don't. They don't. And that doesn't mean, that's not having anything to do with measuring up. Because you can't measure up. He doesn't even want you to try to measure up to be saved. But when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, He expected that you did. And so now, when He's telling you what to do... He's thinking you're going to do it. And when you don't, then he knows that you didn't. That's why he said in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. That doesn't, that's not a measuring up thing. That's just a, an honesty thing. Or were you honest when you said you gave your life to Jesus? Because if you were, it shows in your life. You don't, you don't walk out of church And act like Jesus is not your Lord. And act like everybody else at work. Everybody else at school. No, you're a believer. You're saved. I'm telling you, there are going to be people at the end of the age that are going to be shocked. Jesus said that. He said, many are going to come and say, Lord, didn't we prophesy? I mean, we did stuff. Lord, I worked in the nursery. Lord, man, I, I cut up donuts. Lord. I had a fish on the back of my car. And I, I put that picture of Pastor Ann Kimberly on my refrigerator. How many of you know, that's not what gets you saved. That's not what gets you saved. See, what God's saying is, this is reality. Reality is that Jesus came to save us from sin. And we have to let him. We don't have to earn it. But we need to let him save us. Let let him cleanse us. And walk in truth. Walk in reality. That God is in charge of this world. I can't live like everybody else. Why? Because God is real. God is real. There's a judgment coming. And I need to be right before the Lord. I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. 
And for those of us that make it, and by the way, as pastor, some of you, maybe somebody here thinking, yeah, I ain't coming to this church, man. I don't want to hear about all this stuff. Yeah, go down to the church where they just, you know, it's a spiritual Disneyland. Go down somewhere else. Just go down there. Go ahead. Ride the roller coaster all the way to hell. Because let me tell you, and I'm not, I'm not indicting any church. I have no church in mind. I'm just saying, listen, you want to be someplace where you get reality checks. You need to be in touch with reality. And this word of God is, is teaching us reality. God is saying, I need you to set your house in order. And to do it, you need to be aware that this life is not what this is about. We need to do eternal things. That's what this is about. And we need to keep our minds on eternal things. And keep the fear of the Lord in our hearts. To keep us from succumbing to the temptations that are out there. And so what I'm doing as a pastor and what the Lord is doing to us as a congregation, I'm wrapping my arms around you and I'm saying, I don't want anybody in here to go to hell. I don't want anybody in here. There's no need for it. There's no point to it. Why would you? It's unnecessary. It's unne- well, I just don't have the strength. Well, that, you're not saved because you have strength. Man, all you got to do is call out to the Lord. Lord, help me. Lord, I want to live for you. Forgive my sins. He cleanses you every time. Isn't that right? Forgive my sins and give me strength, Lord, to live for you. You just keep calling out to the Lord. You'd be surprised how strong you become. He is our strength. He is our strength. But see, you got to be real with him. You have been listening to Pastor Jerry Dearman, founder and senior pastor of The Rock, a multi-congregation church originating in Anaheim, California. For audio teaching downloads by Pastor Jerry, directions to The Rock, or to become a partner of Building Solid Lives, go to www.pastorjerry.com or write to Building Solid Lives, 99 East Orangethorpe Avenue, Anaheim, California, 92801.